Good afternoon or morning. Today is Tuesday, April 25th. I'm Dan Hammermesh. It's a pleasure to have with me three experts, international in a sense, on the economics of sports. Why sports for talking about labor? The answer is the economics of sports sense an awful lot of things about labor. The experts I have with me are Larry Kahn, professor of industrial relations and economics at Cornell University. Mike Leeds, who's a professor of economics at Temple University. Kerry Bradford is a professor of economics at Bradford University in the UK. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks, Dan. Let me start off asking Larry a question. Uh, there's a huge literature on discrimination in sports. Uh, how large on average is discrimination in sports? How big a thing is it? And does it differ across minority groups and between men and women? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the sport I know best is basketball. And historically there was a large, all else equal pay shortage for black players. In other words, there was unequal pay for equal work to the tune of about 20%. And there was, this is in the 1980s, and there was evidence of customer preference, fan preference for white players, which I think was one of the driving forces for the black salary shortfall in basketball. But in the, by the way, we got to the 2000s, uh, there's no more evidence of black, of white preference among fans, and the extent of discrimination against black players is much, much less. It's confined to, um, players who are not free agents and who are not on the rookie salary scale. Um, so a competitive market or a union contract seems to be protecting black players in basketball uh, against the against discrimination. I think today the biggest issue is in the NFL. There is a lot of anecdotal evidence of discrimination against NFL coaches. It looks like there is a significant pipeline of qualified assistants, um, assistant coaches among black, former black players typically. And uh, there's at least a lot of anecdotal evidence that they're not getting uh, promoted like um, they might expect to be promoted. Um, as I said, it's anecdotal. There's a really interesting series in the Washington Post, which has a lot of, I guess, testimony from black coaches that, you know, we're not um, we're not given jobs that look like they were um, they were qualified for. You asked in your um, email about soccer. This is a really interesting case. There was a um, interrupt you. Yeah, this is the international audience. Yeah, most people. Call I'm sorry, football, football. football. Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, there was a discrimination case filed by the U.S. women's national team since they in 2016 since they were paid less than the men's team. Uh, since that suit was filed, U.S. Soccer, which is their employer, has signed identical collective bargaining contracts for the men's team and the women's team. And that, you know, we get back to the economics of discrimination. If you go by kind of physical output, the women are producing much more output than the men because they are much more successful in the World Cup. Um, and in the Olympics, but um, a federal court found that the men's team brings in considerably more revenue than the women's team. And I think I think most sports economists would view revenue as the um, you know sort of the correct measure of output as opposed to just victories. Uh, let me ask them. I mean, this is so sort of disturbing. Uh, let me ask around on this. It's a big question. On the one hand, revenue, and we talk about marginal revenue product of teams. On the other hand, a lot of this has to do with prestige being number one. There's no payoff beyond the revenue gain to prestige. Any thoughts on that, Mike? Well, again, I think that um, prestige and $5 will buy you a cup of coffee. <laughs> so I, I think that uh, it it really does come down uh, to the money. I think one of the the paradoxes we have right now is that uh, there seems to be a groundswell of women's sports, both internationally at the soccer level, and in the United States certainly with women's basketball, which indicates that 
with the proper investment, uh, these sports are really uh, prime for significant growth. And so one of the problems we're having right now is almost like a chicken and egg problem that it's difficult for the sports to grow if they're not given the oxygen, if they're not given the funding, but uh, people use the lack of revenue as an excuse not to give them the funding. And so uh, we're kind of caught in this uh, cycle and and, uh, hopefully trying to break out of that. Okay, let me move on and ask you a question, Mike, okay? Uh, In our business, we get trained in graduate school, as it were, and quite frankly, our first jobs certainly in my case, might be viewed as temporary jobs and training. Should managers train and promote, or should they try poaching as Harvard certainly does in the economics world without being too nasty about that? This this is a a classic problem, and one of the kind of distinct pushing features of sports that makes it kind of different from other labor markets is that it's a remarkably thin market, that you have only a few employers or teams that have very unique needs and very unique demands, and you have only a few players who have very unique skills, and it becomes a a really serious matching problem. And one of the difficulties with kind of stepping outside is that uh, what makes a player successful in one setting may not make that player successful in another setting. And so um, a few years ago when um, uh, Paris Saint-Germain hired Lionel Messi, I think a lot of people thought, well, this is it. You know, world soccer is going to be heading through Paris for the next, you know, Uh, maybe as much as a decade. And that hasn't worked out. And I think partly because when you already have Mbappe and Neymar, uh, there's only one ball and and, uh, the value of of Messi is is severely limited. So I think um, when you step outside, there's always this danger of being attracted by shiny objects. And and, uh, I think that that is... uh, one of the big dangers of of stepping outside. Now that said, in American sports, um, at one level, virtually everything is is stepping outside. We don't really grow our own. We uh, rely, uh, you know, certainly football, basketball, to an increasing extent, hockey and baseball, uh, they rely on someone else, specifically American colleges, to develop their talent for them. And we don't really have these academies that that are present in Europe. Hmm. So at one level, we're all, uh, at least in the U.S. uh, side, uh, bringing in people from the outside and and hoping for the best. So what you're saying is, but wouldn't this be less true in baseball, where individuals matter much more and teamwork is very important. Believe me, I've watched minor league games where they can't do a double play. Uh, but compared to soccer or football, if you will, isn't it a bit different here? Basketball may be more like soccer in that regard. Hockey is probably more I think, like I think baseball is really, in, in terms of American sports, baseball is really the exception. That, that is, and, and that is in, indicated in, in a sense by the uh, amateur draft that they have, which in baseball extends basically until people just get tired of selecting players. Right. Uh, <laughs> basketball, it goes only two rounds, but in baseball, it can just go on for days and days until finally someone says, oh, you know, we don't feel like taking any more players. And that's partly because it's so much harder to project uh, talent in baseball uh, and performance in, in baseball than it is in a lot of the other sports. Just to, just to com- go ahead. Yeah, just just a comment on baseball. I was thinking about the Yankees, which is probably the most famous baseball team, and they've done it really both ways. In the 1990s, they put together sort of a, a homegrown group: uh, Mariano Rivera, Derek Jeter, Bernie Williams, Andy Pettit, Jorge Posada. That all came from within 
the Yankees farm system where they were being trained and they were very successful. But then um, in an earlier period, George Steinbrenner was famous for, you know, sort of buying, buying a championship. So I'm, you know, I'm not sure you can say what the answer is to your question, Daniel, which is better, you know, training yourself or going out to um, going out to buy players. I think one so thing that's uh, sorry, go ahead. sorry, I was going to say one development, recent development that's sort of tilting the 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 balance a little bit in favour of growing players, at least in football, is is uh, the sort of developments in, in life sciences where you uh, you can sort of identify better which young players are going to mature to be good um, footballers, and I, I imagine that it, it, you can extrapolate to other sports too because they they can look for sort of uh, indicators of of maturation in players. So rather than just looking at equally aged young players and how well they perform, you can see which players still have the potential to grow a lot more and, and, and become uh, you know, physically larger. So it sort of takes out some of the risk of, of sort of growing your own players. Well, one, one other comment on Mike's, on Mike's point about you know, the minor leagues or colleges with the ability to earn money off names, images, and likenesses the the lines between college athletes, especially um, North American football and basketball, and the pros that that line is getting is is getting very faint, and um, you know so players are moving around much more in college to get better training situations, and they can earn a lot of money. Um, so they're going to be coming to the pros with more college experience under their under their belt. More college experience, but probably no degree in most cases in these sports. Is no, that <laughs> right. But that's irrelevant. They aren't there for a degree. No, no. Folks, even in a place like Cornell, I assume that's well, that's less true there. But no, no, the graduation, graduation rate is very high. Michigan or Texas, which are much bigger trainers in these sports, mm -hmm. the graduation, even Michigan is quite low. Kerry, let me ask you. Okay, we've been talking about who's successful, who's not. How can we measure productivity? I mean, we can't. It's hard to measure productivity for economists, but for a European footballer, how do we do that? Yeah, well, you know, fortunately, I guess for 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 the for for our for our purposes, over the decades, we've had many data-minded sports nerds types that have uh, sort of been thinking about this and developing. Watch uh, out! You're insulting at least two of the people. Uh, on the <laughs> Possibly some of the audience too, but. Yes. Uh, I mean, I guess the you know the, the oldest example would be something like batting average in both baseball and and cricket, where you've got you know some measure of you know the individual's contribution uh, to the game, so you can uh, you know parcel out you know which players were contributing to the team's success, which were most responsible for its failure. Um, and then, you know, over over the years, I think as technology's improved, you know, these individual measures have, have proliferated. So in, in football today, there's television cameras recording every inch of the square inch of the playing field so they can see where, where every player is at every moment during the game. So the team managers have gigabytes of data at their, their hands. They can know exactly how many meters each of their players ran during a game. Uh, who had the ball for how long, you know, what they did with it, whether they passed it, whether they held on to it and tried to score, or whether they were tackled and, and gave it up. Uh, so, you know, they have this sort of granular information and they can try to sort of work out uh, whether their tactics have, have uh, you know, wh whether the, the individual decisions that their players are making or the individual effort that the players are making is is somehow combining to produce a good good team um, outcome or a, a bad team outcome. I think this is actually a great way in which sports is is a nice analogy to the, the wider labour market because we, we can see the individuals going about their assigned jobs and beavering away day by day. Uh, but then we can sort of get a picture of how that how they combine to um, to produce either a good uh, workplace outcome or a or a bad outcome. And it's not just a matter of um, having a bunch of good players on a team. So to take a, a baseball example, I guess you could have two uh, batters on a team. They're both you know, good batters. They get on base regularly, but they just don't get on base at the same time. So they're not very good at you know, generating runs um, for the team. Um, so yeah, I guess the analogy there would be that I, I guess a lot of people would be able to think of examples like this in their workplace where you've got colleagues that are both very good at their job, but they just, for whatever reason, don't don't get on. They don't they don't collaborate and produce you know, what they could potentially um, either through bad management or bad 
you know, uh, structures in the in the workplace or just good old fashioned uh, antipathy between between colleagues. Let me ask you then. The only labor market I know really well is academics. Is academics more like basketball and European football, or more like baseball or even tennis? Where would it be on a continuum between tennis and European football? I think it's. Uh... I guess I guess baseball in the sense that you've got you know the potential to score a home run on your own, but uh, you know a lot of it, and increasingly I think uh, more and more in our field, you need to you need to work together uh, to to get those runs. So probably <laughs> in the baseball area, I don't I don't think uh, you can just rely on your own um, uh, performance uh, I'd, these days. I'd say basketball. You have basketball. stars, but you also have teamwork at the same time. Okay, some of us are just rebounders, others are not <laughs> scorers, sadly enough. Let me ask a different question. You might notice if you're watching this that the gender of all the participants, and I can, I don't know of any female sports economists. Maybe there are one or two. This is a guy thing disproportionately, and the viewers I know full well in terms of television watching are disproportionately men. That's the main reason men watch more TV than women. Why should anybody care about this other than our nerdy interest in sports? And for people of my generation, Larry's too, if you were a nerd in the 50s, you spent your time collecting baseball cards and memorizing baseball statistics. So why yeah. should anybody care about this other than their nerdy interest in watching or learning about the sports? Well, I think there are two recent big reasons one is the data are just much better for testing hypotheses about in you know the area that i did work in which is discrimination but also in um employee incentives we can observe the contracts players are under we can observe their behavior so we have much better data on compensation you know administrative data and also performance and then you've also got these really dramatic changes in the rules you know, all of a sudden a new league is born. And so there's no longer just, you know, employer monopsony or overnight players got free agency in baseball or basketball. Uh, and so we don't really observe those kinds of episodic changes in other labor markets. Um, so I think those are two reasons why economists at least should be, could be interested in sports economics. Let me get one other one, which is one of my favorite papers about 15 years ago. Uh, after the Moneyball came out, people know the Oakland Athletics did real well for a few years. And there's a wonderful graph by an economist showing after three or four years, the knowledge had disseminated to other teams that Oakland's comparative advantage which has disappeared. Isn't that a nice illustration of the role of an innovating entrepreneur who then loses his competitive mm -hmm. advantage? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, and the, I used to Great the, uh, the the bad flip side of that is that bad behavior such as drug taking can also be traced uh, across players uh, in, in Major League Baseball, for example. Right. Mike, you're going to say. Could, if I could just tell me uh, that um, before we came on, on air, I was telling Larry that he is really responsible for my getting involved in the economics of sports, that... Um, I was a labor economist, just a run-of-the-mill labor economist for several years, and I was teaching a course in, in labor economics, and we came to discrimination, and I was looking for a way to present it in a non-incendiary way, and in a way that mm -hmm. would keep students from yelling at each other, and I came across Kahn and Shearer on discrimination in, in the NBA, and it was this, this wonderful way of presenting discrimination and this idea that if black players make more than white players on average, how can there be discrimination against black players? And this whole notion of treating equals unequally, uh, multiple regression, holding other factors constant, was just this wonderful way of getting at what discrimination is and how we measure discrimination. And that uh, really... The, the students ate it up hmm. and it led to my uh, finding other examples and developing a course and eventually becoming involved in research in it. 
But I think that also, you know, to, to, to build on what Larry said, if you're interested in income distribution, the impact of free agency is a, a wonderful way of looking at how income distribution evolves in a market and, and how inequality evolves in a market, uh, in a market system. You can look at uh, discrimination. You can look at gender differences and how whether women respond differently to competitive settings uh, than men do. You can look at, uh, at least in the United States, the relationship between cities and sports and sports teams and sports leagues and talk about uh, urban uh, renewal and urban labor markets. Um, it's, it's really a, tr a, a wonderful Trojan horse uh, mm -hmm. for our students to, to uh, get them involved and engaged in topics that if we presented them straight, would just have caused their eyes to glaze over. Mm -hmm. And I would say one of the uh, one way in which the uh, in way some of the ways in which sports seem weird today might not be so weird in the rest of the labour market in the future. I think you know there's you know, many exact many um, aspects of sports uh, um, labour markets tend to sort of percolate out into the the wider world. You know, for example, the you know we've got wearable technology now and um, activity monitors on our computers potentially that are recording those sorts of granular details of our productivity that you know we. That that you know a commonplace in football and, and and basketball. Similarly, you know there's a concern over the gig economy, um, especially here in the UK. But that's exactly how tennis players and golf players, boxers uh, go about their whole careers. So I mean, there's a lot of lessons that uh, may not seem relevant now for the labour market, but we have ready answers from our study of sports um, if they become more important in the the wider wider labour market in the future. Let me move on and ask a different question. I'm just going to read my question, which I wrote out because I thought I think it's cute. Uh, in 1927, Babe Ruth made $100,000, which was double the U.S. president. He was asked by a reporter, how come you're getting more than the president? And the Babe responded, how many home runs has he hit? <laughs> and today, I think the top baseball player is making probably in the order of $40 million a year, be my guess which is exactly 100 times what Joe Biden gets. Uh, should whoever the top baseball player is today justify it the same way? Or are there other reasons why this wage differential, if you will, has widened so drastically? Let me start off with Mike, then Larry, and then Kerry. It's a general question. Mike, any thoughts? Well, I think one of the big factors driving this is this notion, this uh, area of thought called the economics of superstars. And it used to be, back in the time of, of, of Babe Ruth, that if you were the best ball player in Toledo, that was quite something. Um, and you could draw an audience. The, 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 the local audience was still very, very prominent, and markets tended to be small. But as transportation became easier, as communication became easier, being the best ball player in Toledo being the best soprano in Scranton, Pennsylvania, <laughs> was no longer good enough. And you were competing on a worldwide stage. Um, and so as the market got bigger, the rewards grew as well. And so this is just a natural um, outgrowth of, of the widening of, of the market for, for talent. And you know now you can... If you're the you know the best baseball player, you are uh, on a much bigger stage than you were even in the time of, of Babe Ruth. Okay, I guess we need this for economists too, but it's not happening very soon. Larry, what are your thoughts? I think Mike um, said it very well. The revenues produced by these players have have skyrocketed, and also the market value of of North American sports franchises has been rising typically at rates faster than the stock market. So, um, you know, there these gains, the gains in the revenue are, are it's not just the players that are uh, that are getting them. Let me ask you, Kerry, this has been going on now for quite a long time, where he points out that the rate of growth has been higher than that of the U.S. stock market or any other stock market. Is this excessive growth going to continue or is there some limit on this? foreseeably. 
I, you could you could argue that if uh, you know the likes of LeBron James are known in uh, even in you know the middle of China, then maybe there is a saturation point. Um, but I guess you know like there's other. I mean, it's sports is not unique here. There's music, uh, film, which are similar sort of markets where the you know the superstars clean up. So um, I mean, I, I, what I would say is tennis, which is a sport I've looked at, has you know one of the most unequal distributions of income that I've ever seen. Um, it's uh, just, you know, if it was a country, it would be in civil war because the, the split mm-hmm. between the, you know, the, the top, you know, the Roger Federer's and the Serena Williams and the rest is just, is just uh, so stark. So I think one of the, one of the, you know, the things to, to think about is, you know, what does this mean for sort of harmony between players and also sort of incentives for young players to go into these sports. So we were trying to work out does having, um, you know, these really unequal uh, income distributions put off or encourage young boys and girls to, 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 to go into tennis. And we found that, you know, boys were particularly attracted to the prospect of striking it big in the sort of lottery mm-hmm. of, of tennis. And that, that could have implications if it's, you know, drawing people away from, you know, safer, boring uh, careers um, that, that they could be doing otherwise. But what you're saying is that illustrates, so I think, a well-known thing that men respond more to competition and competitive incentives than women. That's a nice illustration of it. I've seen illustrations typically only in laboratory work, mm-hmm. which I find out rather unconvincing. This is a good one. Let me ask you, gentlemen, any other thoughts on this very broad topic, especially as it relates to labor generally? Any thoughts? Well, I just wanted to mention, I don't know if this relates to labor generally, but I wanted to mention men's and women's tennis, because this is another area in addition to to um, world football, North American soccer, where men and women compete for the same employer in sports. And at the major events, um, Wimbledon, US Open, French Open, Australian Open, and some of the other bigger tournaments, there's now equal prize money for men and women and one table I've been making for my sports class where is one where I got the um, TV ratings for the U.S. Open, Tennis Open men's and women's finals over the last, I've been keeping it for about 20 years. And the ratings are almost exactly equal for the men. Really? I thought it'd be higher for the women's, Larry. And <laughs> women's final. Well, it's interesting. You come from an earlier generation. I think in the 70s, women's tennis with Martina Navratilova and Chris Everett was more popular than men's tennis. But over the last 20 years or so, at least at the finals of the U.S. Open, men's and women's tennis seem to be drawing equally large audiences. I'm surprised because I thought Americans would want to watch Americans. And there have been very few Americans in the finals recently. Whereas everybody wants to watch Serena Williams, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, she's a big part of the uh, yeah. the story over the last uh, the last twenty years. Any other thoughts, Mike, Terry? Well, I think certainly in the United States, you're seeing a sea change. Uh, to pick up on on what Larry was saying in terms of uh, gender inequality. Um, a couple of years ago, there was this very famous uh, YouTube video, I guess it was, or was it uh, Instagram, whatever, one of these um, uh, social media uh, with uh, this women's basketball player showing the difference in uh, the treatment of uh, women in the NCAA basketball tournament and mm-hmm. men, and the difference in the weight rooms and the difference in the conditions. And what I found remarkable about that wasn't that there were these differences, but that people, I think, for the first time, really listened. And uh, I think you're seeing a remarkable change going on in perception of women's sports in the United States, both in terms of the national women's soccer team and the women's NCAA tournament had record uh TV ratings this year. And I think that this is uh, potentially seeing a real change in how a lot of women's sports are being perceived and, and followed in the United States. Interesting. Let me finish up, Kerry, with you. Any thoughts on this or finishing thoughts? I think well, we've been talking mostly about professional sports, but one of the great things today is that there's just, just such a, a massive data available there on, on amateur sport, which I think is we've 
there's been sorely neglected by economists so far. So we know about people in marathons, lower league or, or you know, afternoon football games and, uh, uh, you know, all these, uh, the participation of, of, you know, older people, uh, less fit people, just people, you know, no, more normal people uh, mm-hmm. than these sort of uh, bronze Adonises that we, we see on, uh, we see on our TV uh, all the time. So I think, you know, there's, you know, sports is not just about what goes on in, in the professional sphere, but there's, uh, you know, there's so many interesting questions that we can look at about how people interact um, in their sort of amateur sports. Um, That's a great idea. That suggests for all of us, perhaps the next research topic. Mm-hmm. Think that. For me, it talks about linking time used to sports. Larry, one more finishing thought from you, then we're done. Go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to, to mention, uh, picking up on Mike's point, some of the biggest earners of name images and likeness revenue income in college sports are women college basketball players yeah. and they it's been reported that they've been earning some of the one you know up to a million dollars a year for being a college athlete um and that's another indicator of uh i think the rising popularity in this case of uh, women's college basketball Interesting. Gentlemen, look, thanks for being here. This is for me and I hope for our audience, great fun. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you. you. It's, It's been fun.